Willkommen, meine Freunde, to the next installment of our overview of the 1960s, where the decade keeps rolling out, rolling through, rolling on down, and rolling another number. In at 150, we have Trick Bag by Earl King. New Orleans funkster Earl King comes here with his biggest hit, The White Hot Trick Bag. More celebrated as a writer, Professor Longhair had a hit with his Mardi Gras anthem Big Chief, and Jimi Hendrix put his Come On on Electric Ladyland. 149 Rock Me Baby by B.B. King. The Wonder Wall of the Blues. This is the song that so many young white kids in garages cut their blues teeth on. And getting the white college and suburban kids to play a more blues based style was critical in transforming rock and roll into rock music. 148 Get Up a Diner by Desmond Decker. Scar at his rawest and most frenetic. Decker was to play a major part in sending Jamaican music worldwide with his huge hit The Israelites and his contribution to the soundtrack of The Harder They Come. 147 Pretty Boy Floyd by The Birds. The Birds' Sweetheart of the Rodeo album is often cited as the point where rock took country music on board as a fellow traveller, but that's to ignore this jaunty treatment of Woody Guthrie's bad guy as Robin Hood folk song. 146. Must You Throw Dirt In My Face, The Leuven Brothers. Long before the Davies, Gallagher or Everly Brothers, there were the Loudermilk Boys, Charlie and Ira, the original bickering brothers. Two vastly different personalities, Charlie was mild and religious and beloved by all, while Ira was a hell-raising hell-raiser. They had many great hits across both the bluegrass and the country charts until they split up in 1963. 145, Gimme Shelter by the Rolling Stones in the late 1960s as the American dream dissolved into some kind of a between the Vietnam experience, the Manson killings and the emergence of a harder, murkier drug scene. Gimme Shelter by the Rolling Stones served as some kind of diabolical harbinger of a shift towards doom. 144, Blowing in the Wind by Bob Dylan. One of the difficulties of making up a list like this, the song has to be included to be represented on the basis of its cultural significance. I don't especially think Blowing in the Wind is a very good song. It has a dull tune, its droning presentation and its circular narrative don't appeal to me. But it is emblematic of the role of music in a time and a place played, and I think space has to be found for it. Up next, 143, is the Hendrix of the harmonica, Little Walter, who took the harp to dizzying, amplified directions and created some of the most driving and hard-partying blues music of the 1960s. He didn't outlive the 1960s. He was killed after a backstage fistfight during one of his gigs, dying that night in his sleep from a coronary thrombosis. In at 142 is the Prince, Prince Buster, with his lively celebration of the Jamaican music scene, Shaken Up Orange Street. Buster was relentlessly inventive and always looking to have the final word on the Jamaican scene in the 1960s. But by the end of the decade, he was finding it difficult to fit his message to the roots mentality that was becoming pervasive in the new reggae music. So he relocated to England and a huge expatriate audience there. 141, Carol, the Rolling Stones. What was the greatest phase of the Rolling Stones' long career? To me, it was the period when the Rolling Stones were the greatest blues band in the world, and this Chuck Berry cover demonstrates amply why they were so absolutely ferocious. Compare and contrast with the sleazier and greasier version on the Get Your Yass Yass Out album, and you'll see what I mean. Both of them are good, but one of them catches a band when they're at their very peak in 1964. Loretta Lynn is at number 140. The flower of Butcher Holler, Kentucky reminds us don't come home a drinking with lovin' on your mind. Also, by way of trivia, she's had nine songs completely banned from radio in her career. She's a spunky old gal as Loretta Lynn. 139, I'll feel a whole lot better by the Birds. The A-side of the Birds' debut single, Mr. Tambourine Man, introduced not only the Birds to the wider American consciousness, but a large part of it introduced Bob Dylan to the same. But the B-side, I'll feel a whole lot better, introduced them to the vast talent that is the songwriter Gene Clark. 138, Crosstown Traffic by Jimi Hendrix. Featuring Hendrix on an improvised toilet paper and comb kazoo, this swaggering rocker kicks off Electric Ladyland proper. One of the great problems with Electric Ladyland album is that frequently the rhythm section can't keep pace with Hendrix's ideas, and this is one example of that. But for its sheer, this is rock, this is 1968 groove, very, very, very few songs come close to this one.
Next is one of those songs from the point at which Rocksteady was just starting to turn into reggae. Long Shot Kicked the Bucket by the Pioneers. A shaggy dog story of hard luck at the racetrack, sung with an irrepressible cheerfulness, it's an enduringly popular record from what was possibly the high point of Jamaican music. Just Once in My Life, The Righteous Brothers. One of the dominating figures of the early to mid-1960s was Phil Spector. One of the groups he had the greatest success with was the Righteous Brothers, and when people think of that success, they think of their great hit, You've Lost That Love and Feelin'. I think this is far more a really arresting record, both musically and in the way that the vocalists handle it. Which brings us to another song from the pen of Carol King and Jerry Goffin, as was the previous song. The irrepressible One Fine Day from the Chiffons, the record which, as much as anything, kicks off the girl group craze of the early 1960s. There are those who seem to think these post-Elvis pre beatle years were a dead time for pop music, but I tend to records like this as evidence to the contrary. 134, Fallus Day, Armandul 2. The longest song we've included so far on our little adventure is the title track to Armandul 2's debut album. This is a mesmerising layer of freak-out sounds, ambient noise and abstract percussion, and along with Khan's monster movie album, it signifies the beginning of kraut rock. 133, Tuberculucus and the Sinus Blues, Huey Piano Smith and the Clowns. Huey Smith was one of the original kings of Good Times New Orleans R&B. Strictly speaking, this is a late 1959 record, but it's sort of included here to make up for a strange circumstance on the previous list, whereby Frankie Ford's Sea Cruise was actually recorded by Smith and his band, but the record company wanted a white person singing it, so they removed Huey Smith's vocal and put Frankie Ford on there. So this is some sort of reparation for the great Huey Smith. 132, You Never Can Tell, Chuck Berry. Written while he was hocked up in the bing on Man Act charges, You Never Can Tell continues the aspirational, optimistic story set out by the previous single, The Promised Land. In this song, a young couple fall in love to the bewilderment of their olders and betters, get married, head off to New Orleans, they aspire for things, they work hard, they get a coolerator, a record collection, a lot of ginger ale, and after a year they drive back to New Orleans to celebrate their good fortune and hard work. Why aren't there more songs like that these days? 131, Spicks and Specks by the Bee Gees. The Bee Gees laboured for many years in Australia largely unsuccessfully. They were more successful writing songs for other people than they were for themselves. And in perhaps a fit of misplaced optimism, they booked their passage back to England to see if what hadn't worked in Australia would work in England. Unbeknownst to them, in the six weeks it took them to get back to England, this song, Spicks and Specks, reached the top three in Australia and became enduringly popular. 130. Stony End, Laura Niro. A unique and wonderful songwriter, Laura Nairo was probably the best known obscure act of the late 1960s, largely through the huge number of hits she wrote for other artists, including The Fifth Dimension, Blood, Sweat and Tears, and Barbara Streisand, who did an auspiciously terrible version of this song. Another pervasive myth about Laura is that she flopped horribly at the Monterey Pop Festival, but that just seems to be one journalist kicking a can. All of the other artists there actually say she was one of the hits of the weekend. Never one to seek the limelight her legacy seems to be neglected in the favour of lesser, more accessible and derivative of her artists like Kate Bush, which strikes me as being a little unkind. Laura Nairo died at the age of 50 in 1997 from ovarian cancer. Together again, Buck Owens, number 129. Buck Owens was one of the dominant figures of country music in the 1960s. Buck Owens is still the fourth longest holder of cumulative weeks of number one on the country chart. Owens had 16 number one hits in the 60s, running from flat out rockabillies to good old fashioned country weepers like this one. 128, Wichita Lineman, Glen Campbell. A number three hit in the USA for Campbell, Wichita Lineman is one of the best examples of the totality of pop songwriting that existed in the 1960s. Harmonically dense, melodically fascinating, with a sense of existentialism about the lyric, capturing as it does man's insignificance against the vast backdrop of his circumstances. Campbell loved this song so much when author Jimmy Webb first played it for him, he broke down crying. A masterpiece of 1960s songwriting. 127, Cold Sweat, James Brown. 
As the 1960s wore on, various styles of African-American dance music had begun to codify as a music we know these days as funk. And the leader in that movement was the great James Brown. And the first really funky epic he made was 1967's Cold Sweat. James Brown and his music remains one of the towering pillars on which modern American music is built. 126, You Don't Own Me, Dusty Springfield. I know what you're all thinking, this is a Leslie Gore song. Well, here's the truth of the matter. Once Dusty Springfield gets a hold of the song, it's her song. 125, you're wondering now, Andy and Joey. From the waning days of the ska scene came the mysterious duo of Andy and Joey. I couldn't find a photograph of the man who gave us this irresistibly percolating song, much covered by many acts in the second wave of ska, and to this day, it's still one of the most wonderfully tricky and inventive songs of the era. Cheesecake. Number 124 is Cheesecake by Dexter Gordon, who is unfairly neglected when they talk about the great tenor men of the 50s and 60s. He had a robust but smooth style and always managed to build in a tune to his records, whether he was post-bop or hard-bop or soul jazz or whatever you want to call it. Dexter Gordon's music is always enjoyable and always accessible. 123, Child of the Moon, The Rolling Stones. Child of the Moon is the B-side of the single Jumping Jack Flash. One of their lesser known songs, it's in fact one of Mick Jagger's best vocals and the arrangement suggesting great lassitude was recalled in spirit from time to time on later albums, especially Sticky Fingers and the darker side three of Exile on Main Street. And number 122 is Can I Get a Witness by Marvin Gaye. Much is made of Marvin Gaye's wonderful 70s output, but personally I'd prefer a collection of his 60s sides. While Smokey was the king, somehow the title of Prince of Motown suited Marvin better for all his brashness, energy and dangerous ambition. This one from 1963 sees this son of a preacher man in all his youthful glory. 121, Please Mr. Postman by the Marvelettes. More Motown magnificence, Please Mr. Postman is, if not the most significant record in the label's history, certainly one of the highest magnitude. The first number one hit for the label, the record heralds the sound of young America going nationwide. In at 120, the Stanley Brothers and their rip-roaring country gospel of Somebody Touched Me. This song did duty for many years as Bob Dylan's opening number. Appropriately, given that few acts were as profoundly influential on the young Bob as the Stanleys were. The great Leonard Cohen leaps in at 119 with an enduring favourite in Bird on a Wire. This song down the years has always served as Cohen's reminder that false humility was just as bad as false pride. Friday on My Mind by the Easy Beats. Harry Vander and George Young are rightly famous as the architects of the Albert Records sound in Sydney from the mid to late 1970s, but they were also Australia's premier rock songwriters in the decade before, powering the Easy Beats with hit after hit. Friday on My Mind is the best crafted, best performing and most enduring of these songs. Hank Cochran's She's Got You, immortalised by Patsy Cline, is in at 117. The third to last single that Klein released in her lifetime, it was a perfect example of her ability to pitch a song to both her old and new audiences and her masterful command as a vocalist. Number 116, Hard Man for Dead, Prince Buster. Prince Buster's 1966 take on the edge of rock steady dabbling in rude boy culture, Buster was to become openly disdainful of it over the next couple of years. This classic has just a touch of New Orleans and the horns. One of Buster's most engaging tunes and a perfect example of his famous boop boop beat. Our number 115 is Get Ready by The Temptations. Popular music has been forged on great partnerships between artists, songwriters and producers and few partnerships made magic as regularly and spectacularly as The Temptations and Smokey Robinson. I don't think I'm saying anything too controversial in describing The Temps as Motown's greatest vocal act and to describe Smokey as the best songwriter is a no-brainer. Put them together, you do the math. 114th on our list is I'm Shaken by Little Willie John, which was recently covered by Jack White in a somewhat more hysterical mode. Here the ill-starred Little Willie John takes a cooler approach on this, summoning up the atmosphere that the bare restraint of the lyrics conjures. Described by fellow musicians as well-dressed, mischievous and generous, it seems that Willie's one true vice was his propensity to stab people to death, which he did in 1964. 
James Brown bankrolled his appeal, but he mistakenly crossed a state line, too, in fact, while violating his probation. So it was back to the slam of a willy, whereupon he died of a heart attack at age 30 in the most hilariously named of all prisons, Walla Walla, Washington. 113 and it's back to Sweetheart of the Rodeo, well, sort of, to a song that was left off the album and used as the B-side of the lead single on the upcoming Dr. Birds and Mr. Hyde album. A ferocious diss on Nashville DJ Ralph Emery, this firmly plants the freak flag on Music Row. 112, A Hard Day's Night by The Beatles. The title track to the Beatles' most underrated album, A Hard Day's Night, is the first power pop song and from the first chord establishes itself as probably the best ever power pop song. If one of the essential functions of music is to communicate joy, then this is an essential piece of music. Number 111, I Second That Emotion by Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. This record made number 98 in Australia. Clearly we don't know jack about music. 110, Fruit Tree by Nick Drake. More on Nick Drake to come, but suffice to say this was a fragile, precious talent lost far too soon. 109 sees the genial giant Freddie King in with Have You Ever Loved a Woman, an indisputable blues classic covered by every man and his dog, as has the B-side of the record, The Romping Stomping Hideaway. If you're looking for a better introduction to the electric blues, there are a few starting points more profound than the sadly underrated Freddie King. There's a video coming out soon that discusses Elvis Presley's sadly neglected 1960s output. The movie Fun in Acapulco contains undoubtedly some of Elvis's worst music, there's no room to run in a sports car, the bullfighter was a lady, but it is also has this, Bossa Nova Baby, which is absolutely wonderful fun and on the whole, it is one of Elvis's better films. Green River, Creedence Clearwater Revival. He wasn't born on a bayou, the closest he got to a green river was the eutrophied Puta Creek north of Sacramento. But John Fogarty's songs were as seminal in the development of the music we call Americana as anyone's were. The tragedy of Credence was threefold, a swindling record company, three other people including his own brother who seemed to think that they were equal talents in the band and far from it, and Sue to try to prove it, and a rock press that refused to lend them the kind of credibility that Fogarty craved, dismissing them as a singles band. Fact of the matter is their run of singles from 1968 to 71 was as good as anyone's ever, and as for the albums, there's nary a dull moment on any of them. Great band. A great band. 106 Bat Mocumba by Os Mutantes. Mental tropicalismo from Sao Paulo's finest, the wild mashup of jazzy, Sergeant Peppery style, psychedelia, and Brazilian folk is breathtaking, confusing, and exhilarating all at once. Great stuff. 105 Caroline No by the Beach Boys. This was actually issued as a Brian Wilson solo single, but it soon pressed into service as the crowning glory of the Pet Sounds album. Originally, this was Carol, I Know, a love song to his unrequited high school crush, Carolyn Mountain, but a lyrical tweak from co writer Tony Asher moved this into the classic Pet Sounds motif of carefree youth's rage against the dying of the light. Who was the greatest country singer of all time? Answers on the back of a postcard, meanwhile I'll tell you. It's Lefty Frizzell. Take Lefty's influence out of the equation and you lose Roy Orbison, Willie Nelson, George Jones, Merle Haggard, George Strait and umpteen other singers. Long bouts with the bottle eventually wore him down and he died at the age of 47 in 1975. 103 My Favourite Things by John Coltrane. Elvis Costello said it best. This is hell. My favourite things are playing again and again, but it's by Julie Andrews and not by John Coltrane. People ask why my favourite things is on this list, but spoiler alert, I love Supreme, which many people think is Coltrane's masterwork, is not. Well, given that the remit of this series is not only to point out great records, but help to introduce major artists with whom the audience may not be familiar, because I love you all, my favourite things is the pivotal point in the career of a major American artist. It's the moment where Coltrane starts to transform his music from dazzling technique to high-level conceptual pieces, all the time reading his timeless and wonderful sense of melody, with a melody seemingly as old as time itself. The Ninth Ward of New Orleans suffered devastating damage during Hurricane Katrina. Its musical spirit is best borne out by the great Fats Domino, 
who lived in the ward, but another of its musical heroes is here at number 102, Oliver Morgan, with his murder mystery, Who Shot the Lala? The Lala was Prince Lala who made the original She Put a Hurt on Me, which became a great side for Otis Redding. 101, Fortunate Son by Creedence Clearwater Revival. Unfortunately overdone by pop culture, popping up in this movie or that, this is simply one of the fattest, fullest sounding rockers Creedence ever put out. They put out three albums in 1969. This one is from Willie and the Poor Boys, and it made number three in the US. Creedence still hold the record for the most number two and the most top ten singles without ever having a number one hit in the US. 